La moda per me è quello che uno porta addosso volentieri. La moda per me che la faccio invece è un lavoro e quindi viene, viene, viene vissuta così, con grande impegno, con grande costanza, così come tutti i lavori che vengono fatti nel mondo. La moda è legata singolarmente alla persona, la persona deve sentirsi a suo agio in quello che indossa praticamente, quindi può essere una cosa anche che viene da dieci anni di vita, che ha dieci anni di vita o, o, o essere acquistata pochi giorni prima, ma l'importante è che l'individuo che si veste abbia una sua comodità anche corporea. Sì, mi occupavo di grafica e a quei tempi, circa vent'anni fa, mi venne in mente di cominciare a stampare le t-shirt che erano prodotti usati semplicemente per, eh, come sotto camicia, e cominciare a stamparli e renderli più, più grafici appunto e per fare questo usare una tecnica che si chiama serigrafia che è normalmente adottata appunto per stampare la carta o per riprodurre eh, lavori artistici o perlomeno il mio interesse è sempre stato eh, vicino alla costruzione dei materiali, alla ricerca sui materiali e dei tessuti. Moda italiana significa comunque una, la, forse la, la ricerca più approfondita che è stata fatta in questo campo. Cioè, credo che l'Italia abbia negli ultimi anni offerto così un, 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 un alto numero di, di professionisti che si sono applicati in questo campo e che hanno dato ognuno di loro delle, dei grossi risultati, sia per quello che riguarda l'uomo che per quello che riguarda la donna. Non sono molto d'accordo sul concetto della sfilata perché che ritengo molto superato per, perché sfilata se deve servire per dare un'atmosfera è molto fasulla l'atmosfera di una sfilata o perlomeno non è sufficientemente fantasiosa se deve servire invece per fare vedere il prodotto in senso stretto credo che sia assolutamente insufficiente perché la visione di queste cose avviene sempre molto parzialmente in quanto gli ambienti che ospitano le sfilate non sono adatti per vedere un prodotto quindi io personalmente non ne faccio uso ho fatto qualche eccezione eh, ma ripeto non, non sono molto d'accordo eh, il giovane inconsciamente è portato ad apprezzare quel, molto più della persona adulta è portato ad apprezzare eh, i contenuti veri noi crediamo che il giovane si sia attratto così dalle cose spettacolari o, o immediate in realtà secondo me il giovane viene molto colpito da, da, da aspetti funzionali Settecentocinquantesimo anniversario di Berlino. Il senato della città mi ha dedicato una mostra retrospettiva e una sfilata. Questo invito sottolinea la ricerca che ho portato avanti per anni, studiando materiali nuovi, tessuti che prima non c'erano, stoffe che danno sensazioni inedite, colorazioni insolite. Disegno abiti per un uomo che si muove sul pianeta attraverso ambienti diversi, la natura, il traffico, l'inquinamento, l'avventura metropolitana, per un uomo che è italiano, giapponese o americano. Ho sempre pensato che i miei abiti debbano rispondere a bisogni reali. Dovendo allestire una sfilata non ho immaginato una passerella di reali indossatori, ma una sequenza di situazioni e gesti quotidiani. 
Per questo motivo ho scelto il linguaggio universale dei mimi. Ciò che serve sono innovazioni, non solo formali ed estetiche, ma soprattutto di contenuto. Perciò ho studiato le deformazioni e le impronte degli abiti da lavoro, perché esse indicano quali sono i volumi che rendono confortevoli ciò che si indossa. La mia giacca non mi piace solo esteticamente, ma perché ha molte funzioni, molti ripostigli. Quando 50 anni fa un sarto berlinese, Valentin Mannheimer, inventò l'industria della confezione, cominciò a trasformare prototipi in multipli. Massimo Rossi è sozzosato di moderna interpretazione della confezione sportiva. Per questa ricorrenza, qui nel palazzo del Reichstag, è stata allestita una mostra di una parte dei capi che ho ideato negli ultimi anni. Mi lusinga il fatto che in Germania abbiano scelto il mio tipo di ricerca, quella di un italiano, a rappresentare lo sviluppo raggiunto nel settore. Le mie collezioni non nascono astratamente, ma hanno radice nella nostra storia. Anche da qui, dal cuore dell'Europa, traggo idee e suggerimenti. I miei capi conservano tracce di antiche funzioni. Studio le abitudini del passato e ripensandole disegno abiti per il futuro.
thank you, um, everyone, for coming. Um, this is the biggest hall in Parsons, and uh, we thought it was appropriate for a, a designer of this caliber. And I'm delighted to see so many people who are really passionate about the work of Massimo Osti. Uh, we have here um, Daniela Osti, um, uh, um, Massimo's widow, who worked with him on, throughout much of his career. Um, Ludovico is going to help us with some translation, and Nick Sullivan the fashion director of uh, Esquire magazine. Um, uh, Nick and I come from the same place and spent many years um, influenced by the work of Massimo. Um, so we're gonna talk for about half an hour or so, maybe a little longer, but what I'm really interested in is getting some questions from the audience as well. Uh, so here at Parsons, um, we like to invite intelligent questions. So I know there are some really committed fans of the work of Massimo here, so do please um, spark up with questions. You can see we've got some example of the archive around here, which I'm sure uh, are inspiring people as they look at it. So um, uh, think about that too. So um, I, I was putting together some research, working with some people, and I came up with a word that I haven't heard before, um, but I think I'm surprised we don't use it more, and it's ostian. Um, I think we, you know, a lot of people have done things pretty major in their field, but uh, I think if you think at the industry now, we think about menswear, we think about technical menswear, it's so clear how many people have been influenced by the work of, of Massimo Osti. So, Nick, what do you think about that? I mean, when you think about Massimo's work, and you think about the people that have been influenced, what strikes you? I, mean, I, think, I think I started out in, uh, in, in fashion light years ago, and or at that point, um, I thought fashion was about runway shows, and I was very excited about that, obviously, and I was getting deeply into it. And then suddenly there came along this other stream of fashion which was sort of parallel to it but apart from it. And, and very quickly, certainly in London in those days when I was at, at, at Arena Magazine and Arena On Plus, the, the, the sort of aura that surrounded what Massimo did for CP Company, for Bonneville, for Stone Island was half of what we thought about when we were putting clothes together. For a London... Uh, market, fashion market, there were these two things. There was, you know, there was Armani and there was Versace and there was all that kind of thing. But there was this whole other world that people were, maybe younger people got into it. They got into those clothes younger, even though they weren't particularly cheap at the time. Um, it was like a sort of another side of fashion and it was passionately followed by a lot of young guys in the UK. And so we were very quickly aware of it. Um, and that's certainly that that discipline, that kind, we'll talk about it, I'm sure, what it means while we're, while we're here, but it, it kind of informs all menswear now. Uh, anything that is remotely sportswear comes out of the researches that were done in that period. Daniela, when, um, when Massimo, when you were working together, uh, do you think he had any sense of the incredible impact he was having on menswear in general, globally, or was he just working in Bologna and creating things he loved? No, I don't think he really knew about uh, this big influence at the beginning. Uh, but um, in reality, uh, when he started to work, uh, he immediately started changing something. Because uh, uh, people in uh, the early 70s, uh, they were wearing uh, such a different kind of uh, the men's uh, wardrobe, so, so different. It was uh, uh, stiff, tight, uh, um, hard material, and uh, with, uh, with garment dyeing and all the technique, the textile innovation he has introduced. He changed completely the men's wardrobe. It was a, a new concept of elegance for men that he introduced uh, after his work. So you can see how um, <coughs> practical his clothing was. And you could see how sort of middle-aged Italian men would love it, and they're the ones that could afford to buy it. But did he have a, a perception of the, the young, super trendy people that were wearing it? You know, it was one of those, it still is one of those brands that the people in, you know, it's a designer's designer brand. You know, only when you're in the fashion industry do you really spot that detail and, you know, are you able to see like-minded people. Did he have any sense of that or was he really just thinking of his, himself and his own sort of view of the market? I think when it was Stone Island, was uh, the, um, the first collection he presented at Pitti, uh, was uh, immediately a boom 
was an incredible thing. No advertising at all, no publicity <laughs> anywhere, but was, they sold everything, you know, and uh, they had to stop sell because uh, the factory we should not be able to produce all these uh, items. So uh, with Tonailam, he became a kind of a star. You know, before uh, his work was uh, more subtle, more uh, um, inside the material, uh, more sophisticated, if you want. With Stone Island, it became a kind of uh, explosion. Uh, so, so <laughs> as I, I spent my career before coming here as a designer, and I can remember the design process for us was very much look for inspiration. So your first stop was invariably Stone Island. You know, or a CP company, in fact, I remember the big publications you would put out. And that was great, because that was our inspiration for the season. We'd go and buy that, and, you know, and that's where we'd start. Um, Nick, as, as a non-designer, but someone deeply embedded in fashion, what were your earlier perceptions of, uh, of Stone Island and CP company, the, those being the, the two ones that people readily associate? I mean, we, when I started out, we were doing uh, you know, fashion shoots, and, and we were writing about the way men's clothes work, and what was new and you know that was it was a go-to thing at Pitti Womo as we've just spoken there were a few brands already in that world because the manufacturing in Italy was geared to that kind of thing the textile research was geared to that thing so though they took the lead from Stone Island I think very soon when it, certainly when I started there were already a lot of brands because that way of dressing was a, a whole new thing it was that uh, similar sort of tranche of young Italian guys as you get in, as we know, we'll probably talk about it in the UK, adopted those brands. But it was also a way of dressing that was just completely alien. It was, uh, you know, we'd had army surplus as an idea, as a fashion thing in street fashion for a while. Right, right from, you know, immediately after the World War II, there were trends that involved using army surplus in, in youth markets. But this was reinvented military clothing, and it, it had so much more to it. And it was a very quickly a, a kind of a, I think if you were 18, 20 out on the town, it was, uh, it was a status symbol to have a Stone Island jacket uh, way back then, um, and still is. So what was your first exposure to it then? Did you buy a piece, or did you remember seeing something and, and wondering about it? Um, we were, I'd already been working with, those, with that collection for a while and from seasons, but, but I think I went to... Uh, I discovered there was a sample sale, and I went a bit mental and, <laughs> and bought bought three anoraks and, a, and, a, and I think it was a, a Jean-Paul Sartre inspired uh, Montgomery coat that's um, in the book in fact and I have had one of those um, somewhere maybe in England it still exists I'm not sure where I put it but, but uh, it was very much a label that you wanted to you wanted to wear and you could put it with anything you didn't have to have the whole collection it was but it, for me it was always about the jacket or the coat I mean that's where I guess for menswear most most menswear starts with this, or an overcoat, or something like that. So uh, that was the thing I would always go for. So Daniela, um, clearly Massimo was, a, was something of a genius at innovation. Was it something that he felt compelled to do because what he wanted wasn't out there, or was it just the result of his design process? I mean, can you speak for, for a little bit about the design process, how you came up with, with, with what was created? See, I think um, we have to say that uh, uh, everything was starting by the search. The research for him was a kind of obsession. Uh, he was uh, involved with the supplier companies working in a very um, uh, difficult experiments. Sometimes he had to experiment something himself in the internal laboratory in the CP company because the supplier uh, companies, they didn't, uh, they didn't accept to try these experiments. They said, no, this is not possible. Uh, and he said, no, I want to try, I want to do. And <laughs> so I think uh, everything starts from uh, this uh, research. Sometimes he did something wrong that didn't, uh, didn't go well, but uh, at, at the end he, he was right, you know, he, he started something new every time. He was presenting every season uh, a new material. So it was uh, all year around the research. And that, but he'd start with the material first before he knew what he wanted to do with it? Yeah. He would always yeah. start from the material. Yeah. He was starting with the material, and probably the shapes were adapted to the material. He decided the, the, the shape after the material. Uh, he, was, he used to define himself a uh, fashion engineer. 
you know. Um, his um, work was uh, um, uh, garments uh, object, uh, object of design. He, he, he didn't go uh, to, to look at what the other um, comp competitors or, uh, they do. He, he never uh, went into shop. Me and the secretary, we used to go shopping for him if he needed maybe a socks or something. <laughs> so he, he, wa he was looking to the society, he, he was a kind of sociologist, and he tried to understand what the people need and they don't have, it doesn't exist. He wanted to create something that it doesn't exist, it didn't exist before. So what inspired him? Where did he look? Because we, you know, we're all uh, we're all exposed to the world. What kind of things resonated with him that he drew inspiration from? Uh, see, I, I think everything, every object, like uh, he used to talk with you, and after a while, look of your ring and uh, say, okay, this is, would be good for make a button, and uh, take inspiration. Like a uh, um, thermo joint uh, uh, was inspired by the. Um, Shower curtains. He cut it in a hotel, a piece of shower curtain. And <laughs> it was dangerous to, to lend to him a coat. It was very dangerous because uh, he gave you back without the, the, the pocket, without something. Once uh, I had a raincoat, I put my, my hand in the, and the, the pocket wasn't there anymore <laughs> so, because he has cut it. The, 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 it was so um, um, incredible in this. Um, thermo joint. You just eh? mentioned thermo joint, which was a very revolutionary new kind of construction, wasn't it? it was waterproof yeah. taped yeah. seams that was. When was that? Ninety five, ninety six, maybe. No, uh, thermo joint. Uh, no, ninety four. Ninety four. And um, see, also there is a funny story about the thermo joint. They told me uh, I wasn't there, but uh, they told me because he was obsessed also by garmentine everything. He wanted to garmentine um, any any kind of things, and he decided to garmentine also the thermo joint was PVC. Uh, bonded with a uh, uh, kind of popelin. No, it was thermobonded with a thermal uh, so process. PVC and cotton popelin. Yes, okay. yes, together. And they put in this machine, uh, and when they opened, it <laughs> was uh, melt. <laughs> there was no more jacket there. <laughs> so he um, used to try to uh, take inspiration, especially from military, the military workwear and um, um, extreme sport uh, uh, garments of his archive. At the end uh, of the 90s, he had uh, uh, um, 33,000 uh, garments uh, in this archive uh, from collection, but uh, a lot of from uh, military, workwear, technical things. He was inspired by military because in the military garments there is a higher uh, level of uh, research, technical research, because uh, the, the garment of the military people are made uh, by engineer, technician, not by uh, fashion people. So the technique, and they, and they don't have problem to spend money when they go to research. So there is a level very high. So in terms of the fabric innovation and the styles and the different brands that he launched, what do you think were the things he was most proud of? Most proud? Oh. Uh, mm, no, I think he was proud of... Um, I don't know, no. Because he, he, I think he was proud to have uh, been the first to do uh, some uh, T-shirt when he used to design uh, Chester Perry. Uh, he was the first. He, he, he was called uh, the king of the T-shirt in Italy because he did such a different thing. With, um, and uh, then he was proud about uh, CP Company because of, for him was uh, um, I think CP Company was uh, more the product he should wear. Except for um, the ice jacket camouflage, the, the field jacket, uh, he, he used to love the field jacket, but usually he was wearing more uh, CP Company or uh, uh, CP Collection than uh, Stone Island. But I think he was proud of Stone Island, for sure, because Stone Island was, was um, such, a, such a success. But um, I, he was always looking to the future. 
something new invention every year. He, he didn't think about the past. Nick, as someone that's watched fashion for so many years, are there pieces that really stick out for you as being revolutionary? Um, yeah, it would be impossible to, to sort of name them because almost it was almost as if you you would never find anything that wasn't in some way revolutionary um, in a collection. So literally, you would go through, and and I'm you know running around Milan and going to Pitti, and you go on appointments and you try and spend twelve minutes on one stand and fifteen minutes on another. Invariably, unless you got managed to get on without anyone noticing you, you'd be on that stand for an hour and a half because all of the clothes. It wasn't that they required explaining, but you needed to have them explained. You needed, to, you wanted to know every last detail because every time you lifted a pocket flap, you'd find something that you'd never seen before. And and these are kind of you know to to when you're thinking about big picture, the impact of fashion looks on a runway, you miss all of that. And I think he, he spoke to that a little bit in his, when he was uh, talking about not doing runway shows. These clothes were clothes you needed to sort of handle and get inside and turn inside out and turn back the the other way and take the hood out, take the lining out, try and put the lining back in if you could, uh, which is always a challenge. Um, it, they're, they're clothes that require, they're just so full of knowledge um, that you couldn't do it in five minutes. And that's why it wouldn't work on a runway. Well, I think that's, that, that leads quite neatly into something I was going to come to now, which is that you know, he mentioned in the film that he eschewed the whole runway process. And indeed, the only time we saw any runway action was, was very different to what we, we expect. Um, Daniela, the, um, you were involved in many of the ad campaigns. Um, and the books, as I mentioned earlier, were very inspiring to designers. Can you tell us about some of your favorite moments um, in cr creating the advertising and some of the images that, that you came up with? The images, uh, or I can say I prefer, is the, the photocopies uh, he did uh, of um, some uh, Stone Island uh, items for uh, catalogs, Stone Island catalogs. Uh, they were not word, just uh, photocopied. He, he, he used to take uh, one uh, garment, put uh, uh, behind uh, the cover of the photocopy, and just push. And um, the images are full of uh, shadow and the details. You can see the detail in a very realistic way. And uh, this is one, I think, uh, it's more uh, similar to his idea, you know, to show the products, don't create any atmosphere. Uh, don't make a fake atmosphere <laughs> for to trick people, but just to show the product, show what he was doing, you know. Well, all right, but you can say that, but I think when you look at the magazines, there's a very strong atmosphere. You know, there's a very strong image. Even a flat, and we're all very familiar with the simple flat garment taking up the whole page, but beautifully lit. You know, and, and I don't think any other company was able to come up with something quite as powerful as that. So it was much more than just the product. It was very simple, but it was more than just the product. Where did the kind of concept for that come from? Um, the idea, uh, it, it did, uh, right. at that time, uh, it was the first, I think, uh, to, to photograph uh, the garments uh, uh, flat, uh, not uh, wear uh, in, in this way. And uh, in Bologna, uh, because uh, we, uh, there was a shop uh, where they had, uh, was graf for graphic people, people who make uh, you know, graphic studios and so on, um, where there was a machine, a Canon machine, uh, with a, um, it was a, they, uh, this machine used to make a cybachrom, 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 uh, one to one, so big like this, uh, with two, four light, uh, and so uh, we used to put the garment there, and uh, then, so I think it was a machine was uh, the reason because he made this, um, this choice, uh, you know. And uh, when, uh, um, instead of when he was uh, deciding to, um, to shoot uh, the catalog to, for uh, Bonneville, he decided to do reportage. And also in this case, uh, was something really new, because uh, uh, usually um, the models were posing uh, in different uh, way, and uh, we chose to make a reportage because uh, people were in a real situation, and this also was uh, imitated. Like uh, two years later, Armani made uh, something very similar. I think it's, um, it's interesting, I think it's so slightly parallel by the idea that when I was, at the beginning I was saying that, that these kind of clothes is in an entire industry in a way, uh, but that was started by, by Massimo Osti. 
men's clothes are in a way that those kind of clothes you can liberate yourself from the usual expected way of delivering images and delivering presentations and shows because it's all about the details. So once you can free yourself from the idea that you don't have to get two models, put them in a hotel or a car and get them to pose, the possibilities creatively are to show the product are much freer in that way. And I think, you know, we're messing around today doing these things, we would see other equally sort of lateral shifted ideas in terms of presentation and graphics. And the other thing is you look at those clothes, um, there was a show for Stone Island's 30th anniversary at Pitti Womo in June, and there was a staggering number of pieces from their archive, um, probably more than I've seen in the whole time I've been in this business in a way. Um, and they're all dated and it was beautifully done. You could have taken the dates and someone make mischief and switch them all around and no one would know. There's something very, very timeless about the, the design. If you, see in the, if you get a chance to look at the book, you'll see, you can see stuff from 1988 that looks like it was made yesterday. And that all in turn also means that the, the way you present those clothes is outside it, by necessity, but also it's a, it's a kind of a luxury, but you, you can do it differently. So I think, um, I want to I go back to, a little bit to uh, Massimo's inspiration. Now, we're all very well aware that military was a big source of inspiration for him. And indeed, military has always inspired menswear. You know, the times when countries were at war, everyone wore uniform anyway, and then the same factories made clothing, so it tended to be in that kind of vein. But what was it that drove um, Massimo uh, to be so inspired by military, because it's been around forever, yet no one took it to the degree that he took it to. I mean, he grew up in post-war Italy, where I'm sure, you know, there was a strong presence of it. I think uh, um, the first uh, inspiration, maybe, it should be the, um, in the 68, uh, in Bologna, there was a student movement, and uh, for the first time, uh, the young people were wearing the military parka, you know, the, we called it Eskimo in Bologna. <laughs> I don't know why. And uh, so maybe this was the idea, uh, the first idea. Um, yeah. You know, I don't know. Um, I was one of the person who he used to send every season before starting his work around the world for searching for new things. Any kind of thing that was shocking us and was new, never seen before. And so I used to, to, to travel to London, like uh, I used to visit uh, Lawrence Corner, uh, surplus uh, shop. And once I came back with um, a lot of luggages, uh, pieces of luggages, because I bought all of the uniform in a shop, a military shop that was closing down. So I don't know. Uh, I don't know if. Um, Probably at that time, uh, military also for me was something so new for everybody. It was something that you, you haven't uh, ever seen before. Uh, I don't know. You have had idea? I don't know. Well, I think certainly '68, uh, not just in in Bologna but in Paris as well. There was there was a strong. Um, that there, there's a whole thing with stu student culture in in Europe where the duffel coat became a uh, became a a staple student's item in the 1950s and 60s for students, one, because it was warm, two, because it was cheap, because it was army surplus and there was a lot of them left over. But in the 60s, they also became synonymous with the form of, by wearing this sort of clothing of the establishment, you were also subverting it. So I think there was a lot of, and you saw that with punk and you saw that with lots of other later uh, movements. So I think there was a natural inclination to, to for, for, for young kids who didn't have a lot of money to wear those clothes. Yeah. For me, it was because I didn't have a lot of money. Um, <laughs> no, you know, they no, were cheap. No. <laughs> um, I, was, I, was, I was in uh, San Francisco for one year in uh, 70, 71, and everybody was wearing this kind of, I remember. Mm. And so uh, the reason was that there, there 
was nothing else to buy uh, in the shops that corresponded to the new idea because we had a, such a new idea of to, we have to change the world not going around dressed like uh, uh, my father or my mother you know and in the shop there were nothing so I, I was going by in the second -hand store in the, the flea market in the military market because of the, uh, you feel more free, I don't know. Was, we were not militaristic, not at all. Uh, we hate uh, the military, but it yeah. uh, was the idea to... Um, it was also ironic sometimes, you know, against the war. You know, you used to have uh, the military jacket with the peace and love uh, on your uh, back. So it was something ironic and something that I don't want to be like you, old... Uh, uh, you know, mm. <laughs> so I I, I boring a, people. <laughs> there's another component to it as well. I think when I was very lucky enough to to, uh, to visit Massimo in Bologna, God, a long time ago now, it's 96, 97, when I was at Arena Magazine, partly because we were doing a shoot uh, for Arena On Plus, which is uh, a biannual magazine. I don't know if anyone sees it here, but um, it, the theme was uh, heroes. And so one section of it was a vast still life shoot, very much like, in fact, like the Stone Island kind of shoots we've been talking about, where we needed objects that belonged to people, real objects, didn't necessarily things they were wearing, but we borrowed, uh, we borrowed the skis of uh, an early 20th century explorer who died at the South Pole from the Royal Geographical Society, we borrowed a gun from James Bond archive, and we borrowed some uniforms from Massimo Osti, and I went there to have a look through the archive, of course, there was, as you said, there was how many? 19,000, something like that, 33, right. I think maybe a little bit less when I went there. But, um, but they were in containers outside the building, like shipping containers, because the whole building was full of these things. And I think uh, Massimo mentioned to me, we talked about what we've just uh, spoken about, but he also said, but I have, a j I have jackets that I bought because I liked one button at the bottom. And so I think that a little bit, of, if, I'm maybe sort of speaking out of place here, but I think that the way he worked was, it was not about dressing in a military style, it was about subverting and reinventing those things by taking one pocket that mm -hmm. looked cool for whatever reason and then reinventing that in another way. Yeah, I think, I agree completely. And I think also it was the, the, the main thing was the functionality. He wants to wear himself something comfortable, you know. So uh, when he says also in the, the video, uh, uh, the worker jacket are the deform deformatic, the deformed, the deformed by use. I wanna, I wanna use this deformation and put in the new clothes so you can move. I remember in the, in the 70s, the shirt of the man were like this. It was difficult to to drive a car, and he said, "No, I, I wanna." Be comfortable. I wanna. I think he was producing clothes that he would like to wear. So functionality, many pockets. Like he loved Phil jacket because Phil jacket has so many pockets. So, who did he think was wearing it? So you know, that I, I, I'm aware that you know he's a middle-aged Italian guy, and a lot of middle-aged Italian guys wore it in a certain way. But fashion editors were obsessed with it. You know, it's well known that football hooligans would wear it as well. But who did he have in mind when he was thinking about it? I think he never. Uh, had the uh, um, market inquiry done. He never thought about the uh, target. About, uh, he was thinking about uh, maybe people need something they don't have, you know? So he was uh, inventing something that people mm, maybe need also if they didn't knew. So like CP company uh, was uh, sold uh, between uh, people between uh, 25 to 7. My, my father is still wearing. <laughs> He's 95. <laughs> so um, Stone Island was for younger because more, uh, you know, aggressive. But uh, I don't think he was focusing on who will buy. He was focusing on those people I see in the street walking in such a terrible, dressing in such a terrible way, what they maybe need to feel better? This, I think. <laughs> so he's being entirely altruistic. <laughs> 
So we, we are going to ask for questions in a moment, so do please um, think about what you want to ask. Um, I was at a runway show the other day, and I observed the fashion editor wearing a jacket, and I, I thought I recognised it, but I thought it can't be, and I asked, and it was the Mille Emilia jacket. Um, and it's just as fresh and, and cool looking today as it's ever been. He must have been thrilled by the, the ubiquity of some of the things that he created and the fact that they just never went away. I mean, it's annoying in some ways because you haven't got to buy another one. But they, they became classics and that word gets overused all the time. But, you know, did that resonate with him? Because I'm kind of intrigued by, was he operating in a little factory in Bologna and never really seeing what was going on? Or was he influenced by it? I don't know. Uh, I don't know to say, what to say. Um, about hooligans, like, he, he didn't know nothing about it. Me neither. We, we never heard nothing about I, I was surprised when he was dead because I, I, I was on the internet and so I learned something about it. I didn't know nothing before. And he was, uh, he, no, he was glad of, to be successful and he, he saw so many imitations. And when he saw the imitation, if the imitation was uh, nice and well done, he was... Uh, he was satisfied, like uh, Prada imitated some, something on others. But when the um, imitation was poor, uh, he was disappointed. But, um, um, you know, when things happen to you, you think it's normal. <laughs> okay, so do we have any questions in the audience? Uh, can we put the house lights up, please, in case we can see anyone? Yes, gentleman over there. Um, this is another uh, military inspiration because of the. Um, so we're talk sorry, we're talking about the patch on Stone Island, which I'm sure you're all well aware of. Yeah, I think uh, it's um, from. Uh, see, from the military. Uh, see. See, he decided to put here, I think, because he saw something, I don't know if it's military or police or something, he saw something put here, and he said, uh, okay, we put here instead. instead of, because before, everybody uh, used to put the label inside and never outside. But I think it's a military inspiration also. He, he collects books about uh, badges and... Uh, we still have uh, no? a lot of books of badges. Because like, uh, being a graphic designer, he was fascinated by all these uh, badges. Well, it's another one of those examples of a perfectly logical military detail where they would keep the same jacket and button on their rank of, or insignia or whatever it is. But no one had ever thought to do it for fashion. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Doesn't <laughs> so is there another question from the audience? Yes, in the front. <laughs> um, Massimo was primarily a menswear designer, but later on in his career he actually ventured into women's wear. What drove him to do that and what challenges did he encounter crossing over? Because usually designers tend to go the other way. Sì, eh, he started to, uh, with the first uh, time was with the uh, left hand, he started to produce uh, a women collection because uh, there were nothing on the market uh, uh, in a sportwear sector for women. The, the only sportswear for women were something fake, it was not sportswear, really technical, really functional, it was something that looked like. And he wanted to give to women the same product with high level of content, with the same function, like men. And maybe yes, the challenge was also to uh, convince the, the retailer uh, to put uh, in the window uh, uh, two jackets, men and women, uh, exactly 
the same, that uh, was a little bit strange for them. But uh, what you wanted is to give a product without, uh, you know, the, the um, cute uh, to um, uh, decorative things uh, that uh, sometimes uh, women uh, clothes uh, uh, has. I don't know why they think women has to dress in this way. <laughs> It's, it's interesting because that's still a problem. You know, people still look at women's wear and think, "Why can't it have pockets? What's wrong with it? Why can't we? Why, why can't we offer the same things that we do in men's wear?" Any more questions from the audience? Yes. How was the archive built of the original um, military items, the, the clothing that he didn't design, but the older? I understand there's a large archive of pieces of actual military surplus and things back to, what, the 1930s, 1940s. Did he collect that? Did you collect those objects from, I don't know, um, flea markets or, or shops? How was that? Uh, I, will not, I was not just myself, there was an equipe of people that used to send around for research in Germany, in East Germany especially, they had a lot of this stuff. In Italy, the, since the 70s, there was a place near Livorno where, the, I don't know why, uh, they arrived at the um, Balle, means... Uh, uh, the uh, old stuff from uh, military... Uh, uh, bale, like a bale of... See, si. yeah. yeah. And so I remember people who used to go there to look for strange things. And uh, he was a collector of uh, old stuff. He used to uh, love the old... Also lo uh, old odd objects like bakilite, objects from the 40, the 30. Um, he always loved the... Um, uh, used look of the things. No, he, and uh, so um, all of these uh, items uh, were fascinated by uh, this history, the content. Uh, it's interesting. When I was in um, Florence just last month or two months ago, I uh, met up with another designer you may have heard of called Nigel Caborn, who, um, whose career has been different, very different from Massimo's, but equally inspired by military clothing. And he was in, he took me with him in a cab early one morning, the last day we were there, to um, a kind of lock-up garage in Prato, which is a town just outside Florence, where we went to meet these two slightly kind of creepy uh, guys <laughs> uh, who opened the door and we, we walked in and there was an enormous painting of Adolf Hitler. And behind it were rails and rails and rails of military uniforms. Now they were, they swore that they were not into wearing the uniforms, but they, um, they were collectors. And they had um, a particular pair of trousers that Nigel had found out about that were the trousers worn by a certain type of um, bomber pilot in World War II. And I spoke to Ni Nigel, I've known forever, and he's, he knows about these things much more than I do in a way, but, but he, um, I, uh, he explained to me that on, in the car on the way there, he went through the different countries, like, so I don't really have a lot of American stuff, although there's some good stuff, but there's only certain things that are interesting to me. But he said that the weird thing is that the German military machine, which is what it was in, in the World War II, they spent twice as much money on research and development of the clothing, so the best details actually came out of that military uh, purpose, if you like. Um, but he said, but, you know, the Russian stuff was all done really cheap, and it all fell apart. But uh, So there was a difference between these different places. So where you would find them to build a collection also is a measure of where they came from, in a way. Um, but he didn't end up buying the trousers because they were 5,000 euros. For a, so he said, no, never mind. But, um, you know, but it's an interesting to go on that experience. And I imagine like, traveling around the world as a team to look for and find things. Were you looking for specific things when you went to a specific place, or you no. just saw what they had? No, when, like I was in New York many times. In New York, there, there were not so much military stuff, but uh, there are a lot of second-hand stores, very interesting, with a T-shirt uh, from the 50s and so on. And uh, uh, like if I had to go to London, I decided to go to, to check all the hunting shops 
all the military shop. I was looking on the telephone guide. <laughs> it was going one and one. And, um, but like in Lawrence Cone, once I bought a uh, net, net for us, maybe to cover some uh, guns, I don't know. And I came back with this net, and this net is now in the, you know, the inside of the pocket. So he w but uh, and when, I, when I came home, I was, all, I was uh, putting everything on the floor. And he was going there, and I said, oh, why did you buy this? And I said, oh, because I like the color. Ah, and why do you buy that? Because I like this little thing. Ah. And then he never said anything. After I look at the collection, and he was picking up exactly the, the most uh, particular things. Behind every great man. Um. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a, there's a fashion editor on stage who collects old military uniforms as well, and we don't know whether he wears them. <laughs> so, this has been fantastic. Um, do look, take a look at the book. It's quite remarkable. It's, it's a glorious Bible of uh, technical outerwear and, and design. And these pieces that are on mannequins here, you're not going to see them again. So, um, do pause for a moment and take a look at these. Uh, and then with that, please join me in thanking Nick and Daniela for this fantastic conversation.